Welcome, low ego action heroes. I'm Debbie Levitt from DeltaCX.com. We're a full service CX and UX agency and consultancy. Check us out. We're ready to do some work for you. Maybe some private corporate training or something fun like that. Welcome to our time-shifted Friday stream, Practicing Critical Thinking. This is where, uh, oh, hi, Rima. Um, this is where we've taken some stuff that you previously sent in at deltacx.com slash links, and we are going to break it into a zillion pieces and see what we can uh, figure out about it, see if it makes any sense, see if it's got any value, see if it's wacky. Um, as always, we like to thank our uh, friendly friends who are giving small and large amounts of money by pressing join on YouTube. I haven't updated it in a few weeks, but I will soon. Ah, so thank you to everybody who is keeping me in streaming software and chocolate chips. I had some today for sure. Hi, Malika. So um, I have not had a chance to look at the things that you've been sending in. I've had a wacky week and a busy day. Uh, some of you might have seen me speaking today at the Tech Circus Conference, uh, Business of Design. Let's move these out of the way. Um, so uh, yes, uh, running from one thing to the next. That's why we were time shifted. Hi, Ana Lucia. I hope everyone has a good weekend planned, hopefully some something restful ha 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 uh okay so i've got my uh screen ready to go we're going to take a look at the things everybody's been sending in along with some of the commentary that has come with it thank you for the increased commentary we're now getting that i changed the form so let's take a look if i press this how does that look okay that looks pretty good so here's me and the chat room and the optional tip jar which i think is at delta cx dot link slash tip um and of course my screen so someone sent in does anyone had to know how to print oh hi anna um yes thank you we do this every other week and so i'm happy to be here um especially because uh tuesday i leave for a month on the road i've got so many speaking engagements and uh so we, we have to cancel some of the streams you wizard, you wizard, you way, I don't know. But um, this person's commentary was, website looks pretty impressive for a non-designer. Should designers be concerned about their job security? All right, so we'll check that one off as done. And let's take a look at you wizard, you wizard, you wizard, I, I don't know. So um, basically... It looks like what they're saying, and it says it many times on this page, no design experience required. Um, turn screenshots into editable design. So it sounds like you're going to screenshot something that exists, and then you're going to move it around because the their system's going to break it into pieces for you. Uh, in the old days, uh, who's old enough to remember, we used to screenshot, bring it into Photoshop, and slice it. Who remembers the Photoshop Slice tool? By the way, Slice also available in Aksher. Not sponsored. Um, so uh, you, can, you can do that too. You technically don't need this. Uh, but there you go. Um, and of course, look at this. Take inspiration from the most successful apps out there. So it sounds to me like you should go to somebody else's system, screenshot it, and change it a little bit. And there you go you've got a competing product um, effortlessly no effort required uh, design like a pro even though pros don't do this that much or at least I, I would hope not maybe non pros do it a lot but I know as pros the, the main time I had to screenshot something was an existing client website that I had to make some suggested fixes to I did not I don't think I've ever screenshot a competitor system and tried to move things around and say this is what we'll do and ooh, isn't that different certainly not innovative so who is this tool for it's built for non-designers and designers, non-designers first, we'll get to that in a moment, to streamline design and collaboration, boop, bop, bop, beep. So my impression of this is that if you are not a designer and you want to do some design, 
Well, hypothetically, you can use anything. You could use Microsoft Paint. You could use Figma. You could use, I mean, th please, the list of design tools out there would be endless. But it sounds like a key selling point here is uh, two things. One, screenshot something else and move it around. Or, and two, sketch something and it's going to make an, uh, a, a visual or, or layout design for it. So if the question is, um, is this going to, do people have to be afraid for their jobs? Uh, I think, th again, this just takes something non-designers were doing anyway and makes it a little faster. There is nothing stopping a non-designer from going into Figma and making screens. There's nothing stopping a non-designer from drawing a screen and handing it to developers and saying, make this. Um, so to me, it just makes something that's already happening go faster. And, and technically you don't need this company at all for that. I mean, I know a lot of, say a product manager wants to do design, uh, they might just go into Figma. So I don't think anybody necessarily needs this company. Uh, uh, you might just want a design tool that's what they're made for but i can tell from the way that this is written that we're definitely not the target audience if you're watching this channel you're not the target audience for this this is definitely hey non-designers do you want to grab your competitor's screen move it around a little bit and pretend you have something fresh or hey do you want to draw something on a page and turn it into a, a layout well again you pick if this is something you want to use, you certainly can. What do we think it costs? Anybody want to type in the chat room what we think it costs? Let's see. Yeah, I would have guessed 12 to 15 a month, so I'm not surprised that it's 12 um, a month. And um, very strange that the main difference seems to be 24-7. main difference between the tiers is 24-7 support. Because this is unlimited screens, and this is everything unlimited. I'm not sure what's not. I guess there's some things that are limited. So there you go. Um, again, I don't think you need it. Chances are your company is already paying for a one or more design tools. Some companies have licensed Figma, some Adobe XD, some Principal, some Axure. Um, this means you would have to go and ask for the budget for this too, and you would have to prove why you need it, especially when you already have something that can do most of this. So uh, I think it might be a bit of a hard sell, but I think there will be some people who think it's cool to take a picture of a thing and have it try to design for you. I would personally rather put in the manual work. That's part of uh, what I like about designing. Um, oh, thank you, Kayleen, says Living Finance has subscribed. Thank you so much. I'm sorry I'm, I didn't respond to it. I'm looking at my screen, and so I don't see the overlay that my system puts on, and I don't have my ear, earbuds in, so I don't hear the sounds go off. So thank you to Kayleen for helping me know we have a subscriber. And by the way, everybody, please do subscribe because we're over 6,800 now. I really want to get to 10,000, so please tell friends about the channel. I'm uh, streaming two to four hours a week most weeks. Rima says, I still can't imagine the value behind the features for non-designers. Yeah, I mean, it just seems to be faster. You know, hey, I can draw the thing, take a screenshot, and this thing will try to recreate that. I, I guess if that helps your workflow, okay. But I think many people um, enjoy uh, the design and thinking about it. And as you're putting it together, going, no, that's not right. Let me move this over here. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why I don't sketch first. I just find that um, by the time I'm sketching something, I want something different. So Anna says, I love Figma. If I can do it in Figma, I do, because it's worth it to not learn another site or software. Yeah, lots of people love Figma. Everybody knows I'm a super fan of Axure, and it's the only design tool I use. Still not sponsored. Malika says, this could be good for a draft version, but the time it takes to fix this to pixel perfect level would drive me crazy. That's true. This does not seem to be aimed at the pixel perfect Figma crowd. So great point there. Okay, next we have 
how to sell UX research with two simple questions. And the person who sent this in sent it with this comment. You can skip the fact that this uses object-oriented UX, which people know I'm not a fan of because it just repackages information architecture and we didn't need it repackaged, and some Orca framework, which might be all different names for human-centered design process. I'm more curious what you think about the approach to get buy-in on user research by having stakeholders answer specific questions about features and object. All right, let's see what this person is talking about. So let's see if we can find this in this article. Um, how to sell UX research from a list of part written by the object-oriented UX person. So this is probably going to be a bit of a sales pitch, she said sarcastically, for object-oriented UX, which again, I'm convinced we don't need because we have information architecture. Shweta says, I read this one. I couldn't understand the central point. Okay, that's not good. Um, I think it's wild that a list apart is running ads, Northwest Information Design and Strategy. Uh, weird, weird, weird. Um, okay, so in this article, I'll show you how to collaboratively expose misalignment and gaps in the team's shared understanding by bringing them around two questions. What are the objects? What are the relationships between these objects? Now, again, the object comes from the object-oriented UX thing. So will she tell you what an object is? Let's see. So she says her process is ORCA. Objects, relationships, CTAs, call to actions, and attributes. Object-oriented UX is my design philosophy. Literally, you created it based on information architecture. Um, okay, this I can't figure out. So Orca comes in the middle of a double diamond? <sighs> I, I'm with Shweta so far. I, I don't know, wh I don't know what's going on here. Um, object discovery and relationship discovery shines a spotlight on the dark corners of teen misalignment. Okay, I feel like you said that already. Tree swing. You can't tell everyone you are wrong. Okay. Two questions. What are the objects? What are the... Yes. Uh, yes. Could you please tell me this? I would like to hear this at some point. Why, why am I still not hearing this yet? Hello? Just checking meaningful, actionable, helpful wasn't still on the screen. I built it now so it goes away automatically so I don't accidentally leave it on for an hour. Prep work, noun foraging. Does this happen in the forest? Look, the person who sent this in said we're, we're going to be talking about buy-in. Here we go. Light the fuse. Light the fuse, watch the buy-in for user research flow. Okay, so we've already missed something. By the time she's mentioning buy-in, she's saying you have the buy-in. All right. Um, you know, this is one of those things where I, I, I know I'm a little bit uh, out of proportion here because I, I can't make my way through this article, but I feel like, if you can't explain this to me simply, how can this catch on? How can I get excited about this? Uh, I cannot find the core point of, of what this is. We still don't know what the object is. Does anybody know what the object is? Here's noun foraging. Here's an object definition workshop, because I guess OOUX didn't have enough workshops and we had to really make sure that information architects weren't doing their own jobs alone, God forbid. Um, yeah, so I, I'm going to say I can't even tell what's going on here, and I don't see how this is going to get stakeholder buy-in. I wonder if stakeholders would feel like this is just mumbo-jumbo, but um, I don't get it. I don't get it. So uh, the person who asked the question said stakeholder buy-in because the stakeholder comes up with objects. So let's assume, yeah, Ana Lucia says, I'm confused, so many words, what's the point? Let's pretend that there's something in this person's model that 
information architects could come up with, but instead we're going to let the stakeholders come up with it because when stakeholders come up with a thing, we're, they're more likely to buy in because they came up with the thing. Hold on as I roll my chair over to the side so I can grab something y'all haven't seen me hold up in a really long time. It's covered in dust. My second book, Delta CX. Remember that, y'all? Came out in 2019. No, you don't have to read it. I, I think my new book is much better. This one's pretty good. I'm proud of it. It was just a little too long. Um, but I, I, I said a lot of things in here that I still stand by. There aren't too many changes from this if I had to redo it. But one thing I talked about in here, and some of you might remember, especially if you have a digital version that you can um, search, is what I called, uh, did I call it desperate democratization? Does anybody, anybody read Delta CX and remember what I called my own concept? Del desperate... Oh, gosh, I'll have to open up my file. But anyway, there was something where it was like desperate something. And I talked about how if you have to use a stakeholder's idea to get a stakeholder to buy in, uh, you, you, you're not doing your job. You're just taking a stakeholder's orders. You're just doing what they want so that they approve it. And that's not why we're here. That's not why we're hired. That's not what we do. That's just being a stakeholder's order taker. That means you're being desperate. You're being desperate and you're thinking, well, the stakeholder, let's pretend the stakeholder's idea is bad. If the stakeholder comes up with bad objects or has a bad idea, and we run with some or all of these because it'll get us buy-in because the stakeholder likes to see us use their ideas or objects or whatever. Is that customer-centric? Is that agile? Is that value-led? What are we doing? We're obviously desperate to get some buy-in. I get it, but that's, that's going to be bad. Using bad ideas or bad objects or bad whatevers just to get buy-in it is not the way. So let's move on. Next is the UX cookbook. And the commentary we got said, who should be the target audience for this? Is it good for junior designers? What do you think of the cookbook metaphor? If you click on the link, let us help you pick a recipe, you get to a page where you can select your goal and it gives you helpful options for that goal and further methods of research as suggestions. What do you think of the suggested options? I find the flow a bit weird since you need to select based on what will you find most useful. Then it feels like I need to know which recipe I need from the beginning to be able to choose the right one. Okay, so the UX cookbook, which I've never heard of, so certainly I am not promoting or suggesting this. Let's see. It looks like this is a list of different techniques that you could use for primary or secondary research, both generative and evaluative. So I'm not sure why we're calling these recipes. And um, I don't see design here, so I'm not too sure why they're saying this is research, design, usability, testing, and more. So let's see what they claim is the recipe for card sorting. Card sorting. Are we in, are we in dovetail, by the way? This looks like, it's like dovetail to me. Nutrition profile. Ask people to group cards into categories. Cooking time. Closed hybrid or open. Perfect for prep work. Decide the format and the type of card sort. Prepare the content. Decide if you want to work as individuals or teams. Prepare the cards. Ana Lucia says, it's missing the why part. These are just research methods. A researcher needs to know when and why to apply them. Um, ooh, a thank you to give participants a snack. I haven't heard that one before. I do not recommend food as an incentive. You never know what allergies someone has. You don't want to be responsible for that. Um, setting up your card sort. This, is, this seems a little old school to do it physically like this when uh, you can get much better 
here's optimal workshop. Um, I don't know. Um, this could be okay. It seems to be for newbies. It also makes me think of that book. What's the book with the gray and purple cover? Let me go into my um, Kindle. I bought it because somebody said, oh, it's a great book. I don't intend to read it. I just intend to recommend it to all y'all. Um, Universal Methods of Design. It reminds me of Universal Methods of Design, except I'd probably recommend Universal Methods of Design. Oh, Schweitzer says, I cook a lot. The cooking analogy doesn't fit well. Anastasia says, just true. Reminds me of the Notion interface. Yeah, first I thought it was Notion, then I thought it was, opto then I thought it was Dovetail. Um, here's Universal Methods of Design. Does that, do people know this book? Not sponsored, but I've heard a lot of good things about it. I've heard that it really does... Uh, a decent job helping you understand different methods to use at different times. So let's see, help me pick a recipe. My goal is to better understand users. Yeah, I want to better understand users. I want to, now usually I want to observe users, but let's see what they think if you want to learn how people feel. Feel, how do they feel directly sharing the same experience as users oh yes i want to share their experience try immersion you interact with the product or service as if you were an end user you'll build empathy y'all y'all know what i'm gonna say here I, I don't know who this is i don't know who it comes from uh, I'm assuming that it's, it's either made by, maybe it's made by Dovetail, made with love in Tucson, Arizona. Well, that's my adopted American hometown. The UX cookbook is from the UX team at the University of Arizona Libraries. Um, okay, that's weird. Um, I don't know how to feel about this. The concept's been done before, like IDEO method cards. Um, yeah, I would probably still recommend that book to you. I, I'm not sure about this. This seems a little weird, and I don't know what this toggle is for. Oh, of course, everybody, dark mode. Yeah, I don't get it. I'm, I'm just going to pass. I'm not comfortable recommending something like that. It, it seems a bit strange. LinkedIn user says, I also think the Universal Methods of Design book is a really good book. You need a lot of context, knowing the psych background of each. Yeah, I mean, the, eventually a book has to decide, are we starting with newbies or not newbies? Even the book Larry's working on is the same. Larry decided he's not teaching you the basics of research. He's teaching you more intermediate or advanced techniques, and he's not going to explain the basics of research. So... Gotta start somewhere. Okay, I feel done with the UX cookbook. Next we have Navigating the Future of Design in the Age of AI. Uh, this article's from about two months ago, so it's probably already outdated because of how fast AI is moving. And the synopsis says, the author shares how AI can boost productivity and creativity of a designer. I'm always immediately suspicious of that whenever I see it. There's something very strange about saying your creativity will be boosted by using rehashed things from other sources. Like that, that's... I guess there's some creativity in remixing other things, but, you know, it doesn't totally meet my definition of creativity. Hanna <laughs> Lucia says, I'm already afraid of this article. The integration of AI into UX design has benefits such as improved user experience. If you don't prove this, then this is just crap. You have to say why. So you can't just say, by the way, this is a, new, this is a, a benefit. Everybody knows it. You're going to have to tell us why and how you know this time and effort saving at what cost enhanced interactivity between what and what i don't get that uh the challenges accessibility ethics privacy yeah i'm not willing to trade any of those newsflash not willing to trade any of those you might be that makes us different 
So let's see if we can figure out what this person means because I want to know how they claim it's going to improve the user experience and enhance I interactivity. So let's see. User research and testing. AI can assist designers in gathering and analyzing large amounts of user data. Not yet. Um, do not put your your data into these models. We do not have a good sense of what then happens with your data. In some cases, we've learned that some other company now owns your data. In some cases, your data is training the model, which means if you promised your research participants confidentiality, you are a, a terrible liar. You've now breached that confidentiality, and you can be in big trouble, especially in places that care about privacy and confidentiality like the entire continent of Europe. Hello, Gold. Gold says, how do you figure how something has been done before without looking at other design? What's your take on it? How do you figure something has been done before? Why do I need to know how something has been done before? I just want to see how users do their task now and invent how that could be better. Why do I have to look at other companies' designs? I just want to see how people do their task now, design idea generation. AI can be used to generate design ideas for inspiration. Somehow we didn't need this for the past decades. All of a sudden, oh my gosh, we don't have enough inspiration and ideas and creativity and we have to get it from these rehashed things. So strange, so, so strange. Personalization. AI can personalize the experience. It can adapt interfaces to users' preferences and habits, such as remembering their preferred font size or color scheme. That's not AI, everybody. That's just a database. You could have people tell a, a system now without AI, without machine learning, what font size they prefer. And if they want a darker light mode, this is just saving someone's preferences. I, I mean, this has been around for decades, the entire continent of Europe. Yeah, so um, AI wouldn't be personalizing here. That's just database saving stuff. Usability analysis. AI can be used to analyze user interactions with an interface and identify usability issues. Are you sure? How so? because I don't believe you. For example, AI can track how users navigate an interface, how they interact with specific elements, and how they respond to different design elements. No, that's just called analytics and other tracking tools. We already know that we can track how people navigate an interface. We can know what they clicked on. We can know where their mouse went. If you really want to spend some money, you can know where their eyes went. You can hook them up to machinery and measure their heart rate. We don't need AI for these things. We already have ways to, to have these. So I'm not too sure why this author imagines now we can do this with AI because these are things that we were all already doing how people I, interact with specific elements, we can already know. Did they move a mouse over it to uh, the, the element? Did they tab to that element? Did they tap it? Did they click it? We already know this. AI has nothing to do with it. Um, ultimately, I, I feel like I don't want to read this anymore. Improved user experiences. AI can make interfaces more intuitive, personal, and accessible. Uh, no, you said accessibility was a uh, negative, remember? Anybody remember that? The challenges are accessibility. So wait, you can't say that AI isn't quite getting accessibility right, but then it's going to make an interface more accessible. Yeah, Ana Lucia says, did this person just discover the internet? Uh, you, you might win for today. Um, AI can automate repetitive tasks and help designers save time and effort, such as... I can't think of a repetitive task that I have that I want AI to do. I can't think of a repetitive task that I have. Design, it's like saying to somebody, hey, don't, don't sculpt the whole thing. I'll, I'll work on part of it. It's like, no, if you're a sculptor, you probably want to sculpt the thing. I want to design the thing, and I don't think of these tasks as repetitive or uh, I've never said I, I wish someone would help me save this time and effort. So um, enhanced interactivity. AI can provide interactive features and dynamic content. No, we already do that. 
We already have interactive features. We already have the ability to have dynamic content because we have databases and knowledge. So uh, to me, this is a poor article. And the, the writer, from a writing perspective, the writer didn't do a good job sustaining their points. And some of their points seemed to collide with themselves. So I'm going to go with no on this one. The age of the app is over. I always want to throw an article right into the ocean as soon as I see something like something is over. It's done. You know, I've been reading for 10 years. UX is done. UX is finished. No more UX. UX is going out of business. Um, we've been, se I've seen uh, no more email, the end of email. We're never going to use email again. How many people have seen uh, business cards? You know, no one will ever give each other a business card again because they're going to use Digital business cards. Okay, we are giving each other fewer business cards, but we didn't replace them with a digital business card. We replaced it with add me on LinkedIn. So uh, the age of the app is over. I found this interesting. I'm not sure the structure of the article and the argument is good. Can you go over this? How the argumentation of points they're making, I also find it meaningful in the sense that it's an interesting idea, but not really actionable or helpful for me as a reader. But it might be that the author's intent is just to advertise their approach and product. General note, do all articles need to be, all three, to be good articles? No, we talked about this in a previous episode. It doesn't have to be all three. All three would be great. But if you find something really actionable and mostly meaningful and kind of helpful, that's great. Uh, Ana Lucia says, we're not going to use email anymore. What would we use instead? Yeah, they never figured that out. Ana Lucia, did someone find something better than email? And I don't know. No, I don't think so. All right, so let's see. The age of the app is over. Oh, um, evidently the, the age of browser overlays is, is very much alive because I need to X out the cookie notice and I need to X this out. And here we are on our least favorite friend, Substack. Uh, the age of the app is over. We think in projects, goals, and people. So why are our smartphones built around apps? Well, because companies make apps and offer them to us or sell them to us. And the whole idea would be to take the apps and design and organize and strategize the app around projects, goals, and tasks. Uh, I think this is already a little flimsy. When you wake up each morning, do you think, what apps do I want to use? Yes. Or do you wonder instead, what goals do I want to achieve? No, I'm usually thinking apps. Anybody else? I know I'm waking up and I'm thinking apps, and I, and I have them all in like order in my head, like, all right, first let's see the carnage on LinkedIn and get that out of the way. Did anyone private message me on LinkedIn? You know, then I'm looking at Discord because usually not much is happening there. Though, of course, you can join our Discord for free. <laughs> um, Slack also. Yeah, I'm thinking in apps. For the last decades, our smartphone, last decade, have forced us to think about life in a specific way. There's an app for that. This was comforting at first. Instead of working inside one app at a time, we work across them, pulling together bits and pieces of each to accomplish a task at hand. Do you have an example? A chat room from one app, a style guide from another, a how-to and a bug report, an empty email to write what we learned. These apps bleed together like watercolors to help us achieve one goal. You know, I find that whenever I see an argument like this, that what the person ends up suggesting, I mean, if you go by this argument or this logic, then don't, do you need one app that does everything? Your app is email and it's notion and it's monday.com and it's Jira and it's Photoshop and it's Figma because, hey, then we're not moving across app to app. So I do think this person is just trying to promote their, um, their whatever. And that's fine. We're on their sub stack. They want to promote their thing. We fell for it. We're here. 
Um, LinkedIn user, I think my mental model isn't thinking apps, but channels of communication. Uh, right, maybe. Yeah, possible. But even if we agree with the beginning of the article and say, sure, we think in terms of tasks and goals, because we often do, I'll give the person that, that doesn't mean I want one app that is, is going to try to be all of these things the way I want these things done. This is why companies have competitors. I use Monday.com. You're using uh, Airtable. Someone else is using Google Sheets. Someone else is using Asana. We are all picking different systems because each of us has different ways of doing a thing and we want the, the different ways that, that the company does it and then we find a way to, to bring it together. Yeah, I, uh, this sounds like a, a, a solution in search of a problem and let's look at the original comment again. The argument of the points. Okay, so how are they making points here? Each of the things we need is a page inside the apps we use. We can't tear them out to create a system that works for us. Yeah, this is definitely sales copy because they're saying you have a problem. Whether or not you know it, you have a problem. We're going to solve it. You wish that you could go into all of your apps and just pull one page out and bring them all together. And there you go. And then so we've got arc for mobile because it's going to have everything projects goals tools i think once you want everything you probably want jira like to me when i want one tool that's probably going to do everything if not too much it's probably jira so we designed arc from iphone to be like spaces on your desktop a place to look for things you've saved hold on a little bit there Th I didn't think that was our problem. I didn't think our problem was I can't find the things I've saved. I felt like we were being set up for you need one monster system that does everything you want to do, right? Where was that list we had? A chat room, a style guide, a how-to, a bug report, an email. I thought they were going to bring all of that together, but they just have like... Pinterest? They're going to just bring stuff together to find things you've saved? Pinterest, Google Keep, Notion. I, I don't think we need this. This still seems like a solution in search of a problem. Ana Lucia says, the apps are the mobile equivalent, equivalent of software. I don't get the issue. And it's a sales pitch. A tweet by Christina. Okay, so Christina tweeted... Now what? So what? How might we, someone kill me, create a new framework for computing that feels more like home? Is a question I don't think anyone has ever asked. Have you ever wondered, how might, I wish I had a way to compute that felt like home, that felt like this swivel chair and this cup of water, and my super cute dog, and my green screen. I want my computing to feel like home. This doesn't make sense. I want Disney World to feel like a second home, but I don't understand why combining a chat and a tweet and a spreadsheet and an email is going to feel like home. I, this just see this seems like I'm getting this person's pitch deck and and it's got so much blah 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 blah. I think we call that verbal diarrhea. So yeah, I, I don't think this has um I, I don't think this has really inspired me to do anything. This looks a little bit like Google Keep, even though it seems to be Mac based. Um, I don't get it. But there will be somebody who likes it. So, cool. Cool story, bro. Whatever. All right, let's get that one out of here. Okay, next is tech companies. 
tech companies are making their products worse. Okay, the comment we got was, oh, Ana Lucia says, do you have everything scattered at home? If so, it makes sense that having everything in one page feels like home. <laughs> ah, that is so funny. I'm just going to throw everything in my bed. I'm just going to live in my bed. I'll see you there. No, that didn't sound right. Okay, so the comment we got was thoughts on the content. It sounds like a plausible explanation, but is it? I found sometimes it's harder to distinguish between speculation and assumptions and truth when something is written well. What a super point. Uh, critical thinking snaps to the person who sent this in. That's a nice point. All right, this is Business Insider, which is increasingly seen as a garbage pile from what I'm hearing. I'm hearing that they can be pay to play and and ad based so i wouldn't be surprised if we saw something in this article at this point that we imagine someone paid to be mentioned but let's take a look ed i don't know who ed is um in recent years google users have developed a very specific complaint about the search engine they can't find any answers does anybody feel like they find use the they go to Google and they can't find any answers? None? No, I don't know. How do I not read this? So this is a link to an article I can't read about something I don't believe is true. But this is something that I see done a lot where basically someone says to you, look, this is true. Don't even question it. Gold says, what about a place that links to these things? It might depend on how you view it. Serving for one controller, but anything doesn't really work. You can do that now. I don't need a new app to have a list of links or a checklist or whatever. I mean, I have, I have stuff in Google Keep. If you, if you all don't know Google Keep, just go to keep.google.com. Free. Uh, Google users can't find any answers. That doesn't seem true to me. That doesn't seem right. And of course, it's taking me to an article behind a paywall. So I don't even know what their proof or logic is here. But you've already lost me because it sounds inflated. It sounds uh, exaggerated. A simple search for best PC gaming leads to a page dominated by sponsored links rather than helpful advice. There certainly are sponsored links on the top of Google pages, um, but you can scroll past them and get some hopefully relevant results. Like this isn't, they're setting this up to be like impossible. This sounds like an infomercial, you know. Are you tired of cooking eggs that, that, don't, that aren't eggs? You know, they we're, we're being set up here. Um, meanwhile, actual results are chock full of low quality search engine. I feel like I'm going to be sold something. When are you going to sell me something? Because you're trying to get me to believe that Google search results are the worst freaking thing in the world. And my life is destroyed by them many times a day. So what's your point? Google's flagship service sucks. Um, I hadn't considered that. Uh, Facebook floods users' feeds with sponsored content. Well, that's been happening for at least 10 years. Why are you just talking about it now? And buries the things people want to see under what Facebook decides is relevant. That's their business model. That is the business model. Why are you complaining about that? Facebook is thrilled that you just said that. Facebook is like, yes, exactly. That's what we do. And as journalist John Herman wrote early this, earlier this year, the junkification of Amazon has made it impossible for users to find a high-quality product they want. Uh, not new. What is your point? All of these miserable online experiences are symptoms of an insidious underlying disease. In Silicon Valley, the user's experience has become subordinate to the company's stock price. Well, I don't know when this was written. Does it have a date? Yes. March 27, one month ago. So uh, not only is the user's experience secondary, and we've known that forever. This is not new at all. This guy's writing about it like this just happened. Uh, but we also know that being an employee 
is secondary to the company's stock price. If they think their stock can go up by firing you, they will. No loyalty. Google, Amazon, Meta, and others have monetized confusion, constantly testing how much they can interfere with them. Yes, we knew that about Facebook for like 15 years now. Where I feel like I want to use Ana Lucia's line. It's gonna. We need to make a shirt out of it. Did where was it? Did this person just discover the internet? Yes, that's what I want to say. Did this person just discover the internet? These companies have been manipulating people for over 10 years. Uh, what? I don't get it. Abandoning the core product. What? What is he claiming the core product is? And how is he saying it was abandoned? In some extreme cases, tech titans have abandoned the idea that made them famous in the first place. Uh, the best example of this disastrous search for a second act is Meta, the company formerly known as Facebook. Meta became the most successful social media company because it was a relatively straightforward and attractive way to catch up with your friends. Are you sure? But over the years, the company has obfuscated much of the experience behind exhausting sponsored content and jumbled uh, auxiliary features. The number of people using Facebook's apps has slowed and once explosive revenue growth is faltering. And it sucks. Medicine. So what, what's the point here? And what is this guy selling? He's got to be selling me something. Uh, let me guess. He's got his own consulting company. And, and he's going to fix this for you. Because I, I don't know. There's, and look at all the links. The, did this guy write anything here? Or did he just link to everybody else's article? The amount of links here is really weird. It's almost like he got a, a challenge. Write an article that doesn't say much, but links to all of these other people. Because these people are paying us to write stories that backlink to them. I feel like there's some sort of backlink for sale Thing happening here. I can't prove that, but that is my guess. There's so many backlinks here, it is ridiculous. This almost isn't even an article. Growth mindset is killing tech. It, this is just so inflammatory, and the article's all over the place. He's, a, he's got a business public relations agency. I, I don't even know what he's saying. He's saying everything and nothing, and he's linking to Everybody's linking to all of these Business Insider articles, Mashable. It, it, I can't even tell what's going on. Um, LinkedIn user says, yep, looks worse than a lit review. Yeah, this is, this is just like, give this guy a few. Maybe he's a PR guy. Maybe these are all of his clients. And he says, I'm going to write a story that backlinks to you, and you're going to boop, bop, bop, beep. Um, pass. It's a plausible explanation. What was the explanation? We were we were lost in just a soup. It's just this SEO soup. Okay. TikTok's and shitification, which is a really cool made up word. Summary of the article could be this sentence. Here's how platforms die. First, they're good to their users. Then they abuse their users to make things better for their business customers. Finally, they abuse business customers to claw back all the value for themselves. Then they die. Is it true that this is the typical life cycle for companies? Are we fighting an unwinnable battle as UXers with business? I think we are often fighting a battle that is hard to win. Um, it's not necessarily unwinnable. And I don't think if this is the key sentence of the article, I don't think this is always the way it goes. But I think there is some truth to this. But don't, that's just my opinion. Let's see if this person lays out a good argument with good um, data or information behind it. Here's how platforms die. Okay, we heard this. I call this end shitification. Who, who is this from? Oh, Corey Doctorow. He's still around? 
Um, it's a seemingly inevitable consequence arriving from the combination of the ease of changing how a platform allocates value combined with the nature of a two-sided market where a platform sits between buyers and sellers, holding each hostage to the other, raking off an even larger share of the value that passes between them. Uh, when a platform starts, it needs users, so it makes itself valuable to users. Think of Amazon. For many years, it operated as a loss, using its access to the capital markets to subsidize everything you bought. It sold goods below cost and shipped them below cost. It operated a clean and useful search. If you searched for a product, Amazon tried its damnedest to put it at the top of search results. Yeah, but now it's whatever the last article just said. It's carnage. Um... Advertising is a payola scheme that pits sellers against each other, forcing them to bid at the chance to be at the top of your search, which everyone is doing. I mean, almost all paid search is bid-based, so this isn't special. Amazon clones uh, products from its own sellers, putting them out of business. eBay did it first. eBay used to do that shit. Amazon's late to the party doing that shit, but they definitely are too. eBay was doing it first. Um, but what's your point? And look at the length of this article. Look at where our scroll bar is. And I still don't know what we're talking about. So here's how long this is. Do you want to read all that? Maybe this should have been a book. And does he give you a, a what to do instead? Does he say, look, this is how platforms die. But that's so weird because the platforms he's talking about haven't died. eBay did these things. It's still alive. Amazon does these things. It's still alive. It's doing pretty well if you ask me. So I guess the platforms he's complaining about that he says are going to die aren't dead. Doesn't that very foundational thing right there undo a lot of your article? If you're going to say this is how platforms die, where is your example of the dead platform? Because as far as I can tell, you're talking about platforms that have changed in ways that you don't like and maybe changed in ways that users don't like, but they're not dead. TikTok's not dead. Amazon's not dead. eBay's not dead. Google's not dead. Who else is he pointing a finger at? So, I don't get it. You're saying this is what happens and then these things die. They haven't died. Not one of them. So, what's going on here? I don't get it. Does, that, does someone else get this article? I feel pretty dumb with this article. What am I looking at here? What was that? That didn't make any sense. I think I'm still a little shocked from it. Like, here's how platforms die. And all of my examples are platforms that didn't die. You've undone your own article. I'm done with you. Mm -mm -mm. Hey, we need to talk about the schedule coming up for the channel because I have canceled a lot of shows uh, because I am traveling uh, starting on Tuesday for a month. So there will be a show on Monday. It will be at a strange time. Um, we're going to do uh, at 6 p.m., which is a half hour earlier than usual. I'm going to do the long version of Don't Democratize, since my internet seems to be okay lately. Uh, that will be archived. If you miss it, you can catch it here on YouTube in the archives. Uh, I'm also going to do uh, a Q&A. Uh, we'll see if anybody comes to that, but that's not going to be on YouTube. It'll be on Remo. Then we've pretty much canceled the rest of the week because I'm going to be flying to America and speaking at a conference there. 
The week after that, we do have Tuesday the 9th, Office Hours, Ask Us Anything with me and Dr. Nick. That will be at regular time. Uh, he will be in London and I will be in Dallas, Texas, just on the, the outskirts there. Uh, Wednesday the 10th, we do have community hangout and free group therapy. I might not be able to make it. You'll have to run it without me and it should run without me. Um, let's see. The rest of the week is canceled. The week of Monday the 15th looks like we've got office hours uh, on Tuesday, May 16th with John Brown, who will be joining us live. And that's about it for that week because I'm speaking at a lot of conferences. The week after, looks like we've got community hangout and group therapy. And though I might not, might not be able to make it, I'm not sure. And it looks like Friday will be critical thinking. Uh, so probably the next critical thinking is, is in about a month from now. So I will save up all your stuff. Um, Tuesday the 30th. Ooh. I've got office hours listed, but I might be on an airplane. So that might not make it either. So yeah, unfortunately, most of the shows for May are going to be canceled because of my travel schedule. And um, I used to travel like this before the pandemic, but the YouTube channel wasn't started, so y'all didn't have a sense of, oh my gosh, Jeb canceled a whole bunch of streams because it's uh, because she's traveling so much. But remember, if I am traveling, it's your opportunity to go back into the archives here on the Delta CX channel and watch some stuff that you missed. I'm sure there's stuff that you missed in the micro lessons playlist, maybe some office hours, maybe some of our live streamed podcasts and guests and articles. So if I'm not here, there's still lots of stuff that you can watch and you can always come to YouTube and write Delta CX and whatever's on your mind and see if we've got some videos for you. Cause I think we have almost 800 videos now. Does anybody know for sure? Let me go to my own channel on, uh, on this here YouTube -y thing and see what it says. 773 videos. So chances are I've got something that might help you. Um, oop, a little bit of stri stream blipping. Please excuse me there. So yes, unfortunately, I won't see y'all as much over the coming weeks. I will do my best to stay in touch uh, in various ways. I'll be checking in certainly in our Slack and Discord communities. If you need my attention, you can write me there. Uh, but yes, we're going to have some very sporadic shows for the next month, really through all of May. Um, all right. Thanks for coming to Critical Thinking Stream. Remember, we're not doing the